Hey, what's up? And welcome back to the Relationship Schools Smart Couple Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis, and I'm grateful to be here on this planet, in this time, in this crazy time we're living in. You know, because of these crazy times, it's awesome to have someone in your life that has your back, that you live with and breathe with every day and dream with. And uh, that's my wife for me. And I worked really hard to get that. And I want that for you. I want you to have the kind of partner where you feel deeply known and seen and understood. And you go through this wild ride of life together and you're just stronger. You can do more with someone at your side. That's one of our assertions here at The Smart Couple. And it requires educating yourself and growing up a bit. So that's what this podcast is about. And I hope this has been serving you if you're returning. And if you're new, welcome. Uh, you're in for a treat here. Okay. In this episode, I've got uh, just a longtime pseudo mentor, a guy that I've just tracked for many years, ever since my first therapist handed me this book, Conscious Loving. And, um, you know, it's a pretty old book. And they've since updated it into Conscious Loving Ever After for folks over 50 and beyond. So this guy, Gay Hendricks, is who is on the podcast today. And it's taken me a while to track him down for an interview, but I'm grateful I got some time. So Gay is a PhD. He's the author and co-author of 25 books in conscious relationship, conscious business, and body-mind transformation. He's also written a whole mystery series, which is pretty wild. Uh, I didn't know that. Included are such enduring bestsellers as Conscious Loving. That's like the classic relationship book. Uh, the Corporate Mystic, Conscious Breathing, and Conscious Living. Before founding his own institute, he was professor of counseling for 21 years right here at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where he began teaching in 1974, shortly after receiving his doctorate from Stanford University. Over the past many years uh, of their relationship, he and his wife, Catherine, have raised two kids, accumulated a million frequent flyer miles, and appeared on more than 500 radio and TV shows. Okay, this guy, uh, again... He's quite, quite the knowledgeable man uh, when it comes to partnership. And I asked him uh, just a few questions. Uh, we had a, just a short amount of time. I, I could have talked to this guy for hours and hours. Uh, but primarily, I like to hear how people got on the path. How did you get into relationship work? And how did you become a therapist? So he's got a great story on that around, uh, apparently, he was 100, 100 pounds overweight and if you've seen this guy, pictures of this guy, he's very thin now. So it's just interesting, like, what happened there? And how did he keep it off? Um, so he talks about how he got on the path, how he dealt with his health, and then how he was still stuck in his relationship life. So I think this is interesting. And also how he met his wife. It's a really cool story. And for the singles out there, there's some notes to take around what he said to her and how he laid it down uh, right up front, which I thought was pretty bold. And I, like some people would say that's kind of aggressive. Um, <laughs> not in a perverted or mean or disrespectful or uh, inappropriate way, just assertive in a way that's like, this is what I want. So it's pretty cool. Make sure you tune into that single folks. Um, we talked about fears that come up. Uh, Gay's also written a book called The Big Leap, and he talks about the your zone of genius and the upper limit problem. And I read this years ago, a friend turned me onto this book and it really helped me because I was hitting an upper limit in my development. And he talks about four fears that really keep us from going to the next level. And I dealt with a couple of these fears big time. And his frames on them were really useful for me in overcoming fear. And I had to do some work around one of them in particular. Uh, it was very, very helpful. I also asked Gay about adult attachment and neuroscience. And his, this was, his answer was great because here's a guy who's been in the trenches with people on couples for many, many years, and he's got his own thing. He's got his own technique, and it really doesn't involve like interpersonal neurobiology or adult attachment or anything like that. He just does his jam, and he's got a great example uh, of a story because he's got a pretty keen eye for people's BS. And uh, just it was refreshing to hear because sometimes I can stack on like 500 more tools in my tool belt when I don't really probably need them. I'm just kind of a relationship geek. And I like to understand all the ways in which we can help people. So his answer is going to be interesting there. And then, of course, I always ask my guests, uh, what would you say to a bunch of young people about relationships? So he's got a great answer there. And there's a few really nice um, 
connecting points I think you're going to appreciate about yourself in this podcast. Okay. So let us know what you think. Always go to the Smart Couple Facebook group uh, to join. And just go to your Facebook search bar and hit Smart Couple Monogamy Group. And it'll take you right there. You can ask to join. It's a private group. And there's you know several thousand people in there at this point. And it's an awesome, thriving group. So we'd love you to join. And you can leave comments in there about the podcast. You can ask questions. You can uh, make recommendations. Uh, it's a great place to connect with like-minded, like-hearted growth development geeks like us. Okay. All right. Without further ado, let's do this. Here is Mr. Gay Hendricks. Welcome to the show, Gay Hendricks. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be with you today. Yeah, man. Thanks for taking the time. And I was just telling you, you're a bit of a legend in my mind. Um, so I'm psyched to get to interview someone with as, as much experience as you. Thank you. Yeah. So I first heard about you when I first entered psychotherapy as a client. My therapist, I was probably, I don't know, four months into the therapy session and she handed me this book, Conscious Loving. And I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And what I loved about it was I resonated immediately with you. I think I was still in a little more denial than you were. Uh, you tell a story in that book of being, um, you know, fairly guarded and um, what I, let's see, uh, yeah, your relationship issues, like you were sort of blaming other people and you realized it was connected to your early attachment around six months. Your mom, something happened with your mother. Um, I'm just wondering if you will take us to that story as a, as a way to sort of unfold the conversation into why our past shows up in the present in, in an adult relationship. Well, it was really amazing to me how I, as an intelligent human being, could at one point in my life be so oblivious to, the pa to, to where the patterns came from that were actually causing me relationship problems in the present. And I didn't really catch on to that until I was into my 20s. And, uh, you know, probably if I would have taken Psych 101 when I was a freshman in college, I could have done that, but I, I didn't because in, that, in those days, psychology classes were all about training rats and things like that and didn't have anything wow. to do with people's skills. So, but um, basically what happened was um, I had this pattern in relationships of, I, would, I wasn't able to share my own feelings very well and I certainly wasn't able to listen to the other person's feelings very well. But what happened on a number of occasions is I kept getting abandoned or left behind and sort of for inexplicable reasons. You know, I remember my my first big love when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, everything was going along fine. And then all of a sudden one day, boom, she announced that she wanted to do something else. It was over. And boy, that was just a shocking thing to me. But after that happened a couple of times, I began to wonder what's going on here. And so now back to my own story. What I hadn't realized was affecting me was an event at the early part of my life where my father died when my mother was pregnant with me. In fact, she didn't even know she was pregnant when my father died because it happened like a month or so into her pregnancy. And so when she found out she was pregnant, not only was she having to deal with the grief about the loss of her husband, who was only 32 at the time, like she was, but she didn't know she was pregnant either. So when she found that out, she went into a big tailspin and um, things were kind of in a tailspin still when I got born. And But fortunately, my grandmother was there and she kind of took me over. And then my mother, um, you know, she wasn't around for a while right after I was born. And so I hadn't realized the extent to which that set up a pattern of not being able to connect with people and abandonment. And so it didn't occur to me until I was into my 20s what was actually running my life as far as patterns right. go. And so once I woke up, oh, and by the way, not only did I have some relationship issues, also I was more than 300 pounds. So I weighed 140 pounds more than I weigh now, which is about... 185 or so. I'm about six feet tall. So, you know, my, my weight now is uh, normal for my height. 
But in those days, I was still the same height, but I weighed 140 pounds more. And so I weighed 320 pounds. I was smoking two or three packs of Marlboros a day. I wore big, thick glasses. Um, I was in this real bad relationship, didn't like my job. So things were going all wrong for me yeah. until this one moment in 1969 when I had a big wake up experience. And I wonder, would you like me to go into more detail about, is it okay with you if I kind of tell the, the bare bones detail, the please, gory details? Please, because I, I think this is important for the listener to hear how people kind of wake up out of the trance, you know? Yeah, well, for me, one of the great miracles of my life happened on a January day in 1969. I was living at the time in New Hampshire and it was a very cold day but I went out for a walk on a winter afternoon to kind of clear my head because I'd just been in a big argument with the woman I lived with at the time. And uh, I was 24 years old. And so as I was walking down the road, just kind of pondering what was going on in my life, I stepped on a place where the snow had covered over uh, some ice on the road and my feet shot out from under me and I went whoop down on my back and hit my back of my head. And I didn't knock myself out, but it kind of jolted me out of into a kind of an altered state of consciousness for about two minutes. And I had an amazing thing happen during those two minutes. I, it was as if I could see down through all the levels of myself that I'd never seen before. Like I could see that underneath all of that fat I was carrying were a whole bunch of feelings, emotions that I'd never tapped into things I was scared about, things I was sad about, things I was angry about. And some of them went way back to, you know, my father's death and things that I hadn't even realized were under the surface yeah. emotions that, that were there that I had never paid any attention to. And so as I was laying there, I just let myself feel them uh, probably for the first time. And I was in that altered state of consciousness from kind of the shock of the fall and so I just lay there for a long time, just letting myself feel those emotions. Then an amazing thing happened. As I let myself experience those emotions, an open space, I could feel an open space that was like underneath all of those emotions. And it was a place of pure consciousness that didn't have any kind of programming on it. It was just a place of pure being. And I had never felt that before. And I know a lot of people probably get that feeling through religion or things like that, but I just never had that experience before. So suddenly there I was having this experience of what probably monks meditate to get. I was just feeling it suddenly as a result of this kind of shocking wake up experience. And I did something that I think changed my life or maybe even saved it as I was kind of coming back to reality and realizing, oh, I'm shaking, I'm cold on this winter road and I'm laying out here and, and the sun is going down and I got to walk home two or three miles. Anyway, I was coming back to my normal reality and I made this vow. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to figure out how to feel that state of pure consciousness all the time. Yeah. And so that was my, my commitment. So I came back and I, I just started doing everything different. I started eating different foods. I started, oh, here's a great diet tip for you. If you ever want to lose weight, you probably don't look like you need to, but some of your listeners may. I started asking myself when I would eat food, will this feed my spirit or my old obese body? Mm -hmm. And it came down to the fact that almost with every choice I made, I kept making this choice toward feeding spirit, feeding that pure consciousness rather than feeding my old 300 pound body. And I'm not going to say it was easy or anything, but over the next year, I lost more than 100 pounds, quit smoking, got out of that relationship. Well, that took me another year or so after I quit smoking and everything, but uh, quit eating all the foods that were making me fat. So I lost all the weight. The other amazing thing happened was I didn't need to wear glasses anymore. I started letting myself feel my feelings, particularly letting myself cry if I felt yeah. sad. And I hadn't done that since I was a little boy. I always, yeah. I grew up kind of in the John Wayne era, you know, where you were supposed to suck it up and be strong. Out. And yeah. I grew up in the South. And uh, so there's a lot of that kind of 
ethic down there, you know. And so I just started going the other direction. And as a result, I think of letting myself let the tears come out of my eyes. Somehow my vision changed so that I was able wow. to pass my driver's license test without glasses for the first time since I'd had a driver's license. And so that was a huge moment. Totally. The big magic was in relationship, though, which I know you guys are really interested in, as I am. And the big effect was on my relationships. I want to pause there just to uh, take a little sip of water and, uh, and to... Yep. Uh, uh, see if you have any questions or thoughts about what I've said so far. Uh, not so far. I'm loving the story. Uh, makes a lot of sense for someone who just kind of has awakening experience and then actually applies it and starts to make changes in your life. Like it's really inspiring. You know? Yeah. And I also, it took me another couple of years to figure out what I was doing wrong in relationship after I lost the weight and all that kind of thing. I still continued to have problems in my relationship. I couldn't find the one and I would be in relationships and they would all start, you know, and they would go great for six months and then they would implode. And so I spent a lot of my time in my twenties kind of being in those kind of relationships. And then on another magic occasion, I had another um, unusual enlightenment experience in the sense that I was in the middle of an argument with my then another girlfriend named Carol that I'd been in an on and off relationship with for several years. Now let's roll the clock forward to 10 years later, 1979. So here I am, 1979, I'm much slimmer. I don't have the addictions anymore. And, uh, you know, but I still haven't made the relationship work. So I'm, I'm still in the middle of this. I'm in the middle of this argument with her. And at a certain point, I got a flash of wisdom or enlightenment or something where I realized, oh my goodness, this is not our 500th argument we're having here over the past couple of years. This is our 500th version of the same argument. And I realized that each of them had the same pattern to them. And it was kind of like a quick download that I got where I realized one of us doesn't tell the truth about something to the other one. It could be simple as hiding some kind of feeling you're angry about, or it could be a bigger thing. But one person or the other doesn't tell the truth, and then we start projecting onto the other person. We start blaming the other person. And the other person then doesn't just take the blame lying down. They start blaming back. So yeah, right. you're in this blame game. And uh, Katie and I, uh, in Conscious Loving, and other of our books, say that all couples' arguments, all arguments between couples are a race to occupy the victim position. So one person oh, like takes out a place in the victim position and says, you're doing it to me, or you're not doing it right, or you're not, yeah. um, you're not in touch with your feelings, or you're not playing with the kids enough, or whatever the thing is. It's a blame of some sort. Mm -hmm. person, nine times out of ten, will get defensive and blame back. Yeah. And so I wanted to get out of that pattern. And so I thought, what could I do? Okay. And this is all taking place in my head while I'm having this argument. Okay. And yeah. part of my brain is saying, okay, I see the dynamic. I see what the pattern is. All I have to do to fix it is always tell the truth and always take responsibility rather than blame. So when something comes up, rather than saying, you're doing it to me, asking myself, hmm, what's my role in creating this? Uh -huh. And so those were the two things. The third thing I figured out was we get in fights all the time, me and Carol, about creativity. Because I'm a writer, ever since I could walk pretty much, I've been scribbling little things. And so I'm kind of a natural born writer. And I've written more than 40 books over the years. And so I'm always disappearing into a room for two or three hours a day to do my stuff. And that's been my habit for a long time. That was always an issue with Carol, you know, that when I would disappear into that room, it was like, it wasn't me feeding my genius, it was me taking time away from her. And yeah. so there would always be this dynamic. And I would say, well, if you would just get a creative project that you felt that passionate about, then you could do that. In other words, you could be inspired by my going into a room for two or three hours and working on my book uh, rather than criticizing me for it. But that was the argument that went on. 
Okay, so yeah. three things, honesty, responsibility, and creativity. And this all downloaded in my head like in, I don't know, 10 seconds while I was having this argument. And so she said, I was sort of standing there like, like getting this download. And she said, what's going on? And I said, I just had this realization. This is like our 500th version of the same argument. One of us doesn't tell the truth. And then we start projecting on the other person and blaming. And then underneath the whole thing, is I think we both need to make a major commitment to our creativity, then we would never fight about it. And I said, let's, let's create a new relationship based on those ideas. I was so excited about it. It was like I just yeah. had a bolt of enlightenment. And to my great surprise, she said, no, I'm not interested. And I said, oh, wow. what? Because to me, it was like, I just received the keys of the kingdom. You know, I was so excited yeah. about it. I said, why not? Yeah. And it was amazing what she said, actually. And I, I, I grieve for this moment because, you know, I could see the relationship falling apart at this very moment. But also I felt a sense of liberation because she basically said that she only wanted to be in the relationship if we could both agree that it was always my fault. <laughs> and, uh, and that seems oh, so yeah. bizarre to me. But wow. I appreciate it because I'd always sort of had that suspicion underneath yeah. there, you know, that there was nothing I could quite do that was ever right. And you know that old saying about if a tree falls down in the forest and nobody else is around, is the man automatically wrong? And uh, uh -huh. so that was kind of how I, I was feeling there. So to my great surprise, I, what came out of my mouth next was, well, I guess we're finished then because I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this thing we're doing anymore. So Ah, so I went back to my little cabin that I was living in at the time. I was living in Colorado at the time. And I was a professor at the university there for 21 years in the counseling psychology department in yep. the, from 1974 to 95. And so um, I went back to my cabin and I just sat down on the floor and I spent about an hour trying to figure out what I really wanted in relationship. And I came up with those three things were the fundamentals. I want a relationship where both people are committed to telling the truth. I want a relationship where both people are committed to responsibility rather than blame. And I want a relationship where both of us are passionate about our creativity. And then I said something interesting. I was by myself, so I couldn't have said this to another person, but I said it out loud to the universe. I said, if it's not in the cards for me to have a close relationship in this lifetime, okay, I can live with that. I'm okay with being alone, but I promise you this, I will never settle for anything less than what I really want. You know, this, nice. these three things that I really wanted. So it's here's, how I know, here's how I know that magic really works in the world. One month later, I walked into a room in Menlo Park, California to give a talk and teach a seminar at a graduate school there called the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, where there was probably maybe 50 people working on their PhD degrees and the faculty was there and they were going to hear my talk. And then uh, a bunch of them were going to come to my seminar on the weekend. And so I was giving a talk there and I'd been on the faculty on and off there for many years since they founded the school. Uh, what I did not know was in that room was a woman named Kathleen who now goes by the nickname of Katie sometimes. And she was there their instructor at the graduate school in the field of movement therapy and was also getting her PhD there. She was kind of working for her PhD by teaching there at the same time. And yeah. so um, to make a long story short, she and I connected during the, at a break during the talk where she came over to ask me a question. And I'd sort of checked her out across the circle a whole bunch of times. And she, she just looked so gorgeous and she had this aura of love about her. And so when she came over, I, I said, you know, I don't know anything about you, but I have to tell you, I really admire you and I'm very attracted to you. And I'd love to ask you out for a cup of coffee, but I got to let you know that I just had this big wake up experience and I figured out these three things that I want in relationship. And I said, absolute honesty, taking responsibility rather than blame, and both people committed to their creativity. And I don't want any relationships, even one for just having a cup of coffee, unless they're in that mo mode, you know? You and threw I said, it out so right when you met her. You just laid yeah, that on yeah, the table. Exactly. 
And I don't even know where it came from. It just fell out of my mouth. And yeah. so she stood there listening to this little rap of mine, which probably took me 30 seconds to say. And she was kind of going like, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, I, um, so at the end I said, well, how about it? And she said, how about lunch? And so that was our first big date where wow. we got together. And uh, then uh, later on in the next year, uh, as she was completing her, um, you know, the course part of her PhD and working on her dissertation, she came out to Colorado and we lived there for many years and then um, moved back out here to California in 1995. So Katie and I are just starting our 39th year together uh, this month. And so we... Uh, We've been around the world um, 30 some times teaching our seminars and been on Oprah a bunch of times and been on all the other shows. And so we've had this amazing run of uh, teaching our relationship work all over the world. But it really started in that little moment where we had that first conversation. Well, and it started also when you fell on the ice, right? What an amazing. Yeah, I think the journey yeah. really started that moment when I landed. Boom. Do you, on the ice. Gay, it's a really powerful story. I've, I've got a couple questions about that, that that have to do with zone of genius, because I know in your book, The Big Leap, you talk about the zone of genius and uh, being fulfilled and inspired in your life, and you sort of alluded to it there with the writing in the morning. And I'm curious, um, do you think our zone of genius comes from, like if I look at the arc of your life, right? It seems like you got into relationships because you had relational challenges in your infancy, really. And even mm -hmm. conception. I'm curious, do you do you teach that much? Do you, uh, or is that your view of like where does our zone of genius come from? Does it come from our wound, and our history? Oftentimes it does. Um, and uh, let me say also that what it mostly comes from is what we most love to do. If you look at what you most love to do, whether it's making a soup or writing a symphony or cuddling a newborn. If it's, if it's something you love to do, it's got a flavor of your genius in it. Yeah. So the yeah. way you cuddle that newborn or the way you pay attention when you're making that soup or the way you pay attention when you're writing your poetry or whatever it is that you do creatively, yeah. the way you do it is your genius. And you've got to find out how to, what, what it is that you do that's like that in your life now. When I first started um, thinking about this, I realized that I wasn't even spending 10% of my time in my genius zone. I would, probably wasn't even spending 1% of my time doing what I really loved to do at the time. And it occurred to me that in life, we're always kind of pushed toward getting excellent at things. Mm -hmm. But I was, already, I was already working with people. See, one of the great things, I got my doctorate at Stanford and I worked there for a while afterwards. And it was right in the heart of Silicon Valley where there were all these high tech executives. And so I ended up seeing a lot of high tech executives as a therapist. And one thing that I noticed about them is they would get stuck in what I now call their zone of excellence, where they were doing things they were good at, but didn't really tap into their innate genius. And yeah. so as they would get better and better and better at doing the things they were excellent at, they would gradually get more and more miserable, even, they, even though they were making more money and getting promotions and things like that. They were getting more and more unhappy because they were stuck in their excellence box and hadn't got on what I call the genius spiral. And yeah. so <clears throat> one of the things that I began to really focus on was what's beyond being excellent? What's, you know, what's out there? And, I, and I, that's when I begin to flash on, oh, you know what it is? The people that are really holistically successful, not just successful in one domain, you know, like I've worked with people here in their relationships, like a couple who's a billionaire, but still fight over how much the wife spends on peanut butter. You know, he's mad because she buys the $7 organic brand and he wants her to buy the $4.39 giant jar from Costco. And so yeah. there's, you know, those kind of conflicts and it doesn't matter. You know, I could say to the guy and have, I said, you know, you could buy a jar of peanut butter for everybody on the planet and still have money left over. And 
you know, but it doesn't penetrate because mm -hmm. it's never about the money. Right. In fact, listen up, future therapists and counselors and coaches of the world. Money arguments are never about money, and sex arguments are never about sex. That's always the little um, thing on the top of the surface that's, that's calling your attention, but it's hooked to something right. about one story underneath the house. You so know, what are they about? Down. Tell us. Oftentimes, they're about who's right and who's wrong, who's in control and who's not, um, who's the power person. Um, see, because a lot of people have power issues in the relationship. It's important for them to be right and win arguments and, mm -hmm. um, and, and be in control and make sure yeah. the other person, you know. Uh, so that act of, of being right, of being in control, hides fear. And fear of one sort or another is at the basis of a lot of these issues that you and I are talking about now. You know, uh, you probably, uh, many of your um, um, participants have probably seen my book, The Big Leap, as well as Conscious Loving. The Big Leap is yeah. often used in, by coaches as um, a kind of a manual of personal transformation and how to create success in your life. And one of the things that I talk about in The Big Leap and also talk about in the new book are these specific fears that underlie a lot of these issues. And there are four of them, right? Uh, sorry? Are these the four fears that you talk about? Uh, yes. Yeah. Would you like me to talk a little bit more about those? Uh, yeah, just, just really briefly, because we don't have much time. Sure. But yeah, if you could name them yes. at least. Uh, well, one of them, particularly for people in the transformational arena who are personal growth oriented, one of the biggest ones I found with that population, of which I'm one, obviously, is that there's a fear of outshining other people. Oftentimes, they want to make sure everybody has the credit. Everybody gets a trophy. You know, they don't want to yeah. stand there with the trophy. And it's a good thing, but you got to make sure you're not letting that compassionate concern for others interfere with your own expression of your genius. Because what yeah. a lot of people think, erroneously, it's a thinking error, that if I get in touch with my genius and really shine, it will make other people feel bad. Right. And oh, yeah, I had this one. Yeah. You had that one. Yeah. And I did too. And it's a, it's a myth actually, because how it usually works is once you start shining a little bit more with your genius, it inspires other people to shine. Yeah. yeah. And I, I try to work with people in my seminars to help them get the belief system that if another person shines, that's a good thing because we need more illumination in the world. And it's everybody's right. job to figure out their particular way to shine, not just to compare themselves to other people. Yeah. So that's one of them is the fear of outshining. Probably the most prevalent one that I run into, and I run into it with people at CEO level and corporations, and I run into it with just regular folks, is a fear that there's something fundamentally bad about them a fear that they've done something wrong somewhere in their life and therefore they don't deserve love or therefore they don't deserve money. Yep. And so what you have to do is separate that kind of thing out so you realize, okay, there's my programming. I see my programming, what it's trying to tell me. And now I'm going to choose and make another set of commitments in life. You see, all powerful self-change begins with heartfelt commitment. So you've got to, at some point, make a commitment to a new path, not just try to fix the old problems, but figure out where you want to go now. Um, Love that, yeah. Yeah, because um, I always say, uh, have you ever seen a horse pulling a buggy or a bunch of horses pulling a stagecoach? And they'll say, yeah. yeah. And I'll say, have you ever seen a bunch of horses pushing a stagecoach? And they say, no. And I said, there's a good reason for that, because it's more powerful to be pulled from the future than it is to be pushed from the past. Uh, but you've got to figure out where you want to go in the future to get your horses out in front of you. Otherwise, right. you're just being pushed from the past by what you don't want to create anymore. So good. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Powerful reframe for people, right? Very powerful. Um, it certainly was for me because I, uh, uh, like I always say, I'm my own best customer. And everything in uh, Conscious Loving has been kitchen tested, bedroom tested, and boardroom tested by me and Katie. 
Yeah, exactly. That's how I do it too. I, I have a few kind of rapid fire questions for you. Um, I mean, there's all, everything you've said, I want to dive into 10 X to, to like explore it even more. And we're at limited time. So I, by the way, I have a suggestion. My new yeah. book, the sequel to the big leap is coming out in the fall. And so let's make a, um, uh, an arrangement for me to come back when the new book comes out, when I can do this again um, and give you a whole bunch of new things because I've been sworn to secrecy about not even telling the new book title yet. So um, okay, in at it a little awesome. bit, but I can't really lay it out for you. Yeah, yeah that, that's wonderful. I would love to do that, Gay. Thank you. Because um, I was about to dive into some more questions about this. Um, how do people value themselves enough to, can you give us one tip on how do I value myself enough to know that I can actually be committed, have a heartfelt committed to something in the future and then be pulled forward to it. Here's what we recommend here uh, in our seminars. We ask people to start small. We have them identify some aspects of their genius, first of all. Like for example, this what you're doing now is no doubt an aspect of your genius. Yeah. Right? I mean, you feel alive when you're doing it this doesn't feel like work to you. No, I can no. tell it on your face. You know, you found a way of expressing your genius in the world, but everybody hasn't found that, but everybody needs to identify some things that are their genius. And we ask people to start by making a commitment to doing those things for only 10 minutes a day. Mm. If they will do that for a couple of weeks, just spend 10 minutes a day focusing on their genius. You don't even have to know what your genius is. Just put it in your calendar. Genius focus, 310 tomorrow afternoon, and block out 10 minutes. And even if you just sit there in the room and say, hmm, what is my genius? Hmm, I have no idea. Hmm, just focusing on it, kind of asking the question. Spend 10 minutes focusing on your genius for two weeks and watch what happens. One thing that's going to want to happen is it's addictive. You're going to want to spend 20 minutes, then you're going to want to spend 30 uh -huh. minutes. That was how it was for me. And that's how it is for people that come to our trainings is they get hooked on their genius. And pretty soon they're identifying more and more things that they love to do that they can do in their work. And so I think one of the great transformational events of all time is when you can take what you're already doing and find the absolute genius at the center of it and do more of that rather yeah. than stopping the other stuff. So you just do a little bit more genius because it's contagious. Yeah, great. Thanks for that tip. Perfect. Um, I have a kind of a jumping around here. Another question on, you know, given it's been many years since you've written Conscious Loving, I know you have a sequel for Midlife and Beyond, right? Um, mm -hmm. With all the new research coming out on neuroscience, adult attachment, the nervous system, has that changed the way you see relationships and work with people and couples? Not really. Um, I keep up with the research as best I can. But, you know, I've found that relationship counseling, like other forms of counseling, is simpler the better. Einstein said the task in life is to make things as simple as possible, not mm -hmm. too simple that you can't do them. But I found in relationship, for example, let me just give you the most amazing example. Okay. So a couple comes here from far away. And we have a, a thing we do here where uh, sometimes we work with a couple or executives on an intensive basis where they come in and they're, the, they're our only client for the day or sometimes yeah. even two or three days. But more often than not nowadays, just because of time factors, they'll come in and spend the whole day with us or maybe two days working with us intensively. And so that was the context in which this couple came across the country to okay. uh, be with us. And so one of his problems was incapacitating back pain that just knocked him out about once a week. And he'd have to go get a massage and a visit to the chiropractor. By the time he came here, he'd had something like 175 chiropractic treatments and 100 or so massages, and his back pain was still there. I asked him a question that after he able, was able to answer it, took away his back pain. And here was my question. Oh, by the way, the back pain had been there for seven years. And at the same time, his marriage hadn't been going well. And his wife had also gained 40 or 50 pounds. And that was a big struggle for them. And 
So these were very, very successful, smart people. But you don't have to, I mean, what I learned from myself, I'm a smart, successful guy, but that doesn't always mean you're good at spotting relationship patterns in yourself. You know, because yeah, I've had sure. famous people in here that were at the very top of their professions, and they're not any better at it than anybody else, you know. So, yeah. um, so my question to him was, what is it that you have did seven years ago that you've been lying about to her ever since? Mm. Wow. Well, it turned out that he had been having an affair with his young secretary every Tuesday noon, where when his wife thought she, he was off at a lunch meeting somewhere else, he was actually having the affair with the secretary. So as soon as the truth came out, his wife, of course, was very upset about this and had a big, you know, blow up about that. And so we spent a lot of time working on it. But here's the amazing thing happened. Over the next month or so, after the truth was outed, she wrote us back and said that she had kind of dropped 30 pounds without even dieting. That suddenly, it was like she said her extra fat was a way to protect herself from knowing the truth and feeling the truth of what was going on. So she had distracted herself, and yep. his distraction was the back pain. Totally. His thinking and his unconscious was, well, I'm having the affair, but if I make myself hurt, then it... it balances everything out. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way the body works. That's not the way our, our consciousness works. So fortunately, that story has a happy ending because they were able to rebirth a great relationship. And their daughter, uh, who was having some problems at school, suddenly, you know, things picked up there and were going better. And so I'm a big believer in starting from the source and keeping it as simple as possible. Cool. And one of the best things you can do to keep it as simple as possible is to find out the actual raw emotions that are underneath there driving the current situation. In his case, yeah. it was fear, it was guilt, it was sadness. You know, those are the kind of things that we had to get into in order to release the whole pattern. Yeah, beautiful. That's a great example and keeping it simple too, even though it's like extremely deep and powerful as well. So uh, we just have a few minutes left, Gay, and I have a question for you. I, I don't know if you know, but I started this relationship school because I'm on a mission to educate young people on the planet on how to do love relationships well and how to work out our differences. And I ask every guest, if I had a room full of a thousand teenagers uh, who aren't getting currently educated on relationships other than what they see. Um, what, and you could whisper one thing in my ear. What would you want those young people to know? Just one thing out of all this experience you have. I'd say three things in one sentence. I would say, feel your feelings, tell the truth, and keep your agreements. Because those three things are the source of about 98% of the problems that people have in relationships. Some people get in problems with breaking their agreements and not knowing how to fix it. Some people get in trouble because they don't know how to, how to feel, their, uh, how to tell the truth. And a lot of people get in trouble because they don't even know what they're feeling or how they're feeling at any given moment. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I really appreciate that you're working with younger people because I go into schools um, a lot of times and I... I talk to people and, uh, you know, I'll be talking to a class. I'll get invited in to talk to the 10th grade at a school here nearby. And I love it because these kids are asking questions about relationships. Oh, yeah. I didn't even start to ask until I was in my 20s. And yeah. uh, so it's a good thing. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. There's new research out that uh, a Harvard study said that 70% actually of teens and young adults want to learn and be educated on love relationships. So we're going to I was one eight. of those. I didn't know anything about it when I graduated from high school. I think it's a form of yeah. educational malpractice not to teach people about relationship skills. Oh my god. I got all the way through a master, all the way through high school, college and a master's degree without having anybody sit me down for an hour even and teach me a class about how relationships really work. That's what, what I'm saying. I what you and I discovered here or talked about here that we've discovered over the past hour if people only knew that, they'd be a heck of a lot better off. Than I mean, exactly. Their minds would get blown, their hearts would open, and they'd be like, okay, I, 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 there's a way here. There's a path for me. That's why I have great hope in the world, actually. I know it's a 
crappy world we live in in many world ways, a lot of stress. But, you know, I've been around every, I'm, I just came back from 10, um, 10 days in Asia and we've been everywhere teaching our seminars. And it doesn't matter if, if people are speaking Swahili or French or English or, or whatever they're speaking, they're always asking the same questions about relationship. Really simple right. questions like, should I leave or should I go? Uh, yeah. Questions like, um, how do you solve a problem without blaming anybody? You mm -hmm. know, and these are skills that, I mean, literally, they could be taught in the first grade. Yeah, totally. Thank yeah. you for getting that. I mean, and thank you for all the work you do um, on this subject. So just because to respect your time, uh, will you tell folks where we can find out more? And, and I'm going to take you up, Gay, on that um, offer to come back in the fall and let's do an inter another interview. So where can people find Absolutely. you? How do we find out about more of you and all your 40 books and all that? <laughs> okay, good. Well, they can find my books everywhere, but uh, the, uh, our website, uh, hendricks.com, is probably the number one place to look, and that's H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. And um, although I met Jimi Hendrix one time back in the 60s and had the opportunity to shake his hand and tell him how much I appreciated his concert, he spells his with an X. We spell ours with a CKS. So CKS, we're members okay. of a different family. But I ha had a great deal of uh, uh, passion for uh, rock and roll music in those days. And I had the opportunity to meet a lot of great rock and rollers of the 60s and 70s. Um, so um, Hendrix.com is the way to go there. We also, where a lot of our relationship materials are housed, like our e-courses, is at heartsinharmony.com. Hearts okay. in harmony.com. We'll and include those in the show notes for the listener. Oh, good. Yeah. So you can go over there and find out all about our courses. Like our, our probably one of our most popular courses for singles would be attracting genuine love. And okay. then we have ones for couples that are in long-term relationships and um, ones uh, courses on money, how to handle money and courses on how to handle sex. So there's all sorts of different things that you can learn at heartsinharmony.com. Okay. Wonderful. Well, Gay, thanks so much. Uh, I look forward to chatting again. And again, thanks to you and your wife for mining so many amazing uh, tools and frames and uh, insights for us. Well, thank you. And back at you. I really appreciate you, what you're doing in the world. And uh, I enjoy the questions you ask. It's always refreshing. I've done 2,500 interviews. And I think it's number 2,568 or something like that. Uh, it's always great to be ask good questions and by somebody who's obviously read my books. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many interviews I do where the person has just picked up the book uh, uh, that her, their TV producer has handed them and uh, now they turn to me and do of the course. interview. You know? And uh, yeah. I appreciate your research into the ideas. Yeah, you got it. All right. Thank you, Gay Hendricks. Good interview, right? He's full of wisdom. Guy's got a lot of experience. Go to heartsintrueharmony.com to check out Gay Hendricks' work. Type in Gay Hendricks in the Amazon search bar or the Google search bar, and you'll find all of his stuff. All right, tons of great resources, including books, audio CDs, uh, CDs, did I say that? Uh, MP3s, you know, classes online, a lot, a lot of resources. Okay, next action step. Ready? Remember about 25, 26 minutes in, he talked about the four fears that hold most people back. And he wrote about this in his book, The Big Leap, and uh, where he talks about your zone of genius and being yourself and going to the next level. A lot of us have what he calls the upper limit problem. And these four fears keep you from going to your next level. So write down which fear he mentioned that you connect with the most. For example, one of mine historically was, well, if I shine my light bigger and I'm brighter, other people might feel bad. And I'm such an empathic relational guy. I don't want people to feel bad. So I better plan to kind of play it small here. So I had to work on that. All right. And you might have to work on something like that too. So write down all four and then circle one. And then here's your next step is share it with someone. Own it. This is one of my fears, friend, honey, partner. And here is what I'm going to do about it. Okay. And then make a commitment to take action. And one of the places you can take action here is the relationship school. And our foundational community is called the Relationship School Roots Community. Go to relationshipschool.net forward slash roots to join. And it's a live group coaching practice call every two weeks uh, with one of our senior students who is a certified relationship coach. And she's going to guide you through a number of tools and practices. 
And it's also a place to feel less alone in this personal growth journey. If you're feeling like you're the only person in your life that is working on this stuff, come hang out, join a community. One of the most powerful uh, vehicles for transformation. If we want to go to the next level and stay there is a positive, pure growth culture. People surrounding ourselves with people that are also growing because your friends, I guarantee you are holding you back unconsciously. Your family's holding you back. So if you want to go to the next level, you got to surround yourself with good growth oriented people that are going to cheer you on through the discomfort. All right. So relationship school.net forward slash roots and come hang out with us. All right. We have calls on Wednesdays. Hope to see you in there. And thanks again for your ears, folks. Take care.